So, uh, welcome back, everybody, after, gosh, um, welcome back, everybody, after the um, coffee break. Um, hope you had a nice long coffee, enjoyed your nice long coffee break um, after the opening plenary. So we've got the first um, of the two APOPs sessions. Um, so just do a bit of an introduction about APOPs um, before we launch into the, into the speakers. Um, so can I have, have the next slide, please? Um, so APOPs is um, it's the network operations group for the Asia Pacific internet. Um, three of us look after it. So it's myself, uh, Philip Smith, um, there's Tomoya Yoshida um, and Maz um, Yoshinobu. Looks like an old thing, because Tomoya, yes, multi feet. So, and Maz, we're from IIJ. Um, website is apops.net. Um, not a lot happening on the website, but it's very much just an information placeholder. And of course, we have the mailing list, um, which you're welcome to join. It's low volume compared with. Um, several other operations lists, but you're welcome to join it for announcements and, and so forth. Uh, next slide. Um, APOPS is part of the regular Apricot program. I think we've had a part of Apricot now for what, seven or eight years? Um, and what we use the APOPS piece for is very much the, the plenary like, like this and like the event tomorrow. So, more for presentations which we feel, we as being the program committee, feel would be of most interest to the uh, internet community. Um, so we've got the two sessions um, today and we've got one tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Um, we also have lightning talks taking place on Thursday afternoon. Um, so if you've never heard of those before, lightning talks are 10 minute presentations. You don't need to uh, provide slides, but obviously if you have a slide or two explaining what your talk's about, it helps with the PC trying to uh, decide uh, which of the submissions to use. So you've probably got email already uh, this morning um, to, with the call for uh, lightning talks. So if you've got something what does it say in the description? A little bit wacky, a little bit crazy, a little bit interesting, a little bit topical, um, and you want to share it with the audience, uh, please do so. So that session will be at 2 p.m. on Thursday. What we generally do is um, in the 90 minutes, we have, well, obviously nine presentations. We generally line up 10 or 11 pre presentations for the lightning talk session, um, and the PC picks the best ones um, out of everything that's submitted. So. Um, sooner you submit, I think the higher your chances of actually getting um, on the agenda. Wi-Fi, I think you've probably realized that uh, the password has been on the screen here um, during the opening plenary. Um, please use the apricot SSID. So certainly in the last 90 minutes or so, we've had several folks saying to us, but I don't see an apricot SSID. Well, the Apricot SSID is using five gigahertz. Cisco has been a very generous equipment donator for this conference, and we very much appreciate their support. The thing we just discovered is that the access points are Chinese spec, and they only have four 802.11a channels, which we have just discovered most laptops don't use. The fix is actually very simple, and it reminds me of a little skit from the IT crowd, that UK um, sitcom about um, well, an IT department and a big anonymous company, where the standard answer of somebody phones was to say, turn it off and turn it on again. Well, guess what? If you actually turn off your laptop, I mean hard off, switched off, and power it back on, you will see the 802.11a network. So that's just a little discovery that the tech team made during the break. And many people have disbelieved and they have tried and it seems to work. So if you're not seeing 802.11a, in other words, the apricot SSID, switch off your device. Not, don't just reboot, switch it hard off and then switch it back on again. Seems to be affecting some laptops and not other ones. If it still doesn't work for you, of course you've got the, the apricot B, which is the 802.11b, the 2.4 gigahertz. So, on the screen now we have today's uh, three presentations, three speakers. 
Um, we have Roland Dobbins up first, then we have Cody Williams, and then Hideo Ishii. So I think I'll stop talking and invite Roland to the stage. Thanks, Roland. Slides, please. Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Roland Dobbins. I work for a company called Arbor Networks. My title is Senior ACERT Analyst. I work for the Arbor Security Emergency Response Team, or ACERT. We do things like infiltrate botnets, and um, we actually take apart the malware and the, and the bot code and, and uh, examine it. We develop countermeasures for DDoS attacks. Uh, we also get involved in escalations for high profile um, DDoS attacks and other types of security situations. And I'm here to talk to you today um, about a DDoS attack campaign that started in late uh, 2012, went on into 2013, and may have kind of teed off again, at least in a small way, uh, this year in 2014. Um, it's the Operation Abbeville, um DDoS attack campaign against primarily U.S. financial um, institutions. It's a high, very high profile DDoS attack campaign, and it was somewhat unusual in a number of ways. And so we're gonna talk about that, talk about what providers and, and enterprises could have done to improve their defenses, talk about what they did right, talk about how they improved. Um, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. We're doing manual um, slide control here. Um, DDoS attacks are relatively easy but presentation technology apparently is uh, a bit more difficult. So, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, what is a DDoS attack? DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service Attack. Um, basically, these are attacks that attackers are launching in order to render applications, services, data, utilities, things of this nature unavailable. Um, they're almost always distributed. Um, so we really refer to them as DDoS attacks. Uh, no real distinction between DOS and DDoS. You'll see primarily the term DOS, DOS, used to talk about um, exploits that cause some kind of program race condition or a wedge or something like that. So these are DDoS attacks. And uh, something that a lot of folks don't seem to realize about DDoS attacks is that the collateral damage uh, that results from these attacks can actually be significantly larger and have a greater impact footprint than whatever negative effects are experienced by the targets of the attack. So these are not harmless attacks. They cause problems for people very broadly in many different cases. Um, these attacks are not trivial. People say in many cases, oh, well, it's a DDoS attack. No data was stolen. No personally identifiable information was compromised. But the simple fact is that if you have any kind of revenue stream, that's associated with public online internet properties, if they're used for customer support, if they're used for anything that is vital to one's business or livelihood, then DDoS attacks cost money. They cost money in terms of the OPEX or operational expenditure that's utilized to defend against them, lost revenues, brand impact, all of these different kinds of things. So these are not harmless attacks by any stretch of the imagination. And a key, thing, a key element to remember about DDoS attacks is that DDoS attacks are essentially attacks against capacity and or against state. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So, in classical information security, there are three main characteristics of InfoSec. It's called the CIA triad, not Central Intelligence Agency, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so the ultimate goal of information security is to maintain the security of all three of these characteristics or categories. Next slide, please. Availability is what we're talking about when we talk about DDoS attacks. DDoS attacks have a negative effect on availability. And so when we're talking about defending against DDoS attacks, what we really mean is that we need to have the ability to maintain the availability of applications, services, data, and so forth, even when under duress and under attack. Next slide, please. So, Operation Abbeville. This DDoS attack um, was launched in September of 2012. And this organization, they call themselves the Cyber Fighters of Izad Din al-Qassam. 
they posted on pastebin.com and they said that they were going to, they wanted to launch DDoS attacks against Bank of America, the New York Stock Exchange, supposedly in response to some trailer for a movie that was never made that was actually posted on YouTube. Um, the security community originally called these attacks Triple Crown because the attackers were using three primarily distinct attack methodologies, but the attackers themselves later on said that their moniker for this attack campaign was Operation Automobile, and so folks pretty much switched over to that. The attack campaign went on for many different weeks. Um, the fifth week of the uh, attack campaign was announced uh, on Pastebin in the middle of October. Prior to that, something that was very interesting about this attack campaign is that the attackers would name the targets ahead of time, and they would even specify the time windows during which they were going to attack those targets. Not unheard of, but, but highly unusual. Um, phase two of the campaign was announced in December of 2012, um, and on January the 8th, the attackers, or someone who had demonstrable foreknowledge of the attacks posted on pastebin.com, some very convoluted formula related to this video on YouTube and how many hits it had received and how many views um, it had received, and said that they were going to continue their attack campaign for 56 additional weeks. Um, May 6th, the attackers said that they were going to pause their attack campaign against the financial institutions because the anonymous organization were supposedly going to launch an attack campaign called Op USA, and so they did in fact pause these attacks. And the Op USA week came and went with no attacks from Anonymous that were identified actually materializing. But then this attack campaign didn't come back either. After that week, they didn't start up again. Um, in, on, in July of 2013, the attackers had this abortive phase four, just a few hours of attacks that week. Um, then there was an additional attack in August, one day of August of, of 2013, and then nothing more except, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, thank you. Yep, so phase one, one, to two, one or two targets were concurrently attacked. Um, most of the attack traffic was either layer seven traffic, it was HTTP or encrypted uh, HTTP traffic, and the attackers were attacking both random URIs as well as URIs that they had identified previously um, via reconnaissance against the targets. Um, they were also sending a, a relatively large amount of these malformed DNS queries. Um, these were about 1,300 byte packets, and they were sending a lot of this traffic. Um, we were looking at something initially when the attack campaign started around 60, 65 gigabits per second uh, per target, and then that escalated later on. In phase two, the attackers stepped up their game, and they started attacking between three and five different targets um, simultaneously. They were still doing a little bit of SSL, but they had primarily switched over, uh, of HTTP, HTTP rather, but they had primarily switched over to SSL for almost all of the layer seven um, stuff that they were doing. They were still continuing with this very high bandwidth malformed um, DNS queries that they were sending, um, and they started to move down market. This is when um, the, the targets and the ISPs and MSSPs who were defending them really started to get their act together. And so the attackers weren't having as much quick and easy success against their chosen targets, and so they started moving down market from the big financial institutions to smaller regional banks and credit unions and organizations of that type. February, phase three, uh, no, please come back. I'll, I'll speak and tell you when you advance the slide, thank you. Uh, phase three, six or seven different organizations were attacked simultaneously um, with differing attack characteristics per target before the attackers had used the same attack mixture just with some customized URIs and things like that that they were attacking for each individual target. Um, but this time they were using radically different methodology, still within that same, those same categories of methodologies, but the attack um, traffic classification varied uh, a considerable amount for each target. Um, also, they really moved down market to some very, very small credit unions and other organizations that had never, didn't even understand what a DDoS attack was. Um, and they also started attacking 
some financial services organizations which don't deal directly with consumers. Um, che ACH check processing companies and things like that. So they were still staying within the financial industry, but they were going after some back-end services um, at this point. It actually served the banks rather than anything that was consumer-facing. They also started attacking um, financial institution that was based in Europe as well, um, which was interesting. Um, phase four, a few hours of attacks, um, two or three institutions simultaneously. Um, they have somewhat improved their attack methodology. Before, they were firing all these UDP-53 large malformed DNS queries at web servers. Now, that was working, and we'll talk about why. But they actually wised up a little bit and realized that maybe it made more sense to, to send a lot of UDP-53 towards authoritative DNS servers. Um, and they started doing that um, the, for the authoritative DNS servers of the organizations that were targeted. Next slide, please. And so th we thought that was pretty much the end of the story. <coughs> Excuse me, the end of the story. But a couple of weeks ago, on January 28th, this botnet went active again. And it attacked a couple of different financial institutions simultaneously. They were using a radically different attack methodology uh, than was, was being used previously. I can't disclose that today, but it was very, very different than the, the, the attack traffic that was used in 2012 and 2013. Um, there were no postings on pastebin.com claiming responsibility for the attacks. Uh, a group calling itself uh, European Cyber Army or ECA were on Twitter. They were claiming responsibility for the attacks. They didn't do that ahead of time, so they didn't demonstrate any foreknowledge. We don't know um, if this group was responsible or not. Given the radically different attack methodology, <clears throat> one theory is that a different group have taken over at least part of this botnet and are now using it for their own purposes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the botnet itself um, was started off with just a few hundred compromised servers. Um, the maximum number of servers that were observed during the bulk of the attack campaign was about 20,000, 20,000 compromised service, servers. Right now, there's roughly 3,000 servers um, associated with the spotnet. Um, <clears throat> as ISPs and hosting providers would discover these bots and take them down, the attackers were continually trying to recruit new members of the botnet throughout the bulk of the attack campaign. Um, they were, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, they were, they were uh, constantly tinkering with the code as well. We actually saw them changing significant elements of the attack code in response to what defenders were doing. Next slide, please. So this was a multi-stage and multi-vector um, DDoS attack. The servers that were utilized as bots during this attack campaign were primarily PHP, WordPress, and Joomla servers. They were running content uh, management systems that had, were older versions that had well-known bugs, so it was relatively easy for the attackers to compromise these servers. The attackers did not have root on these servers. They compromised these servers in whatever user context was running the content management system in question. None of the attack traffic, that, or the, the, let me rectify that, the, the vast majority of the attack traffic used in this attack campaign was not spoofed. It was not spoofed because the attackers didn't have root on the servers uh, that they were using. Um, they were doing a lot of um, HTTP gets and posts. Again, they had done their homework. They had identified a number of URIs on each of the targets. They were doing things like going after the login subsystems that consumers would use to log in to banks. They would identified large PDF files that they could download and spin up back-end disk arrays and consume outbound bandwidth things of this nature. They also sometimes were do, using random URIs that looked as if they were plausible for the institution that they were uh, attacking, but it actually didn't go anywhere. Um, they were doing this over HTTP and HTTPS primarily, but they later switched over almost exclusively um, to HTTPS. Um, in phase, the, the end of phase one, beginning of phase two, they started doing query floods, layer seven query floods, against the authoritative DNS servers, but these were not the DNS servers of the organizations that they were targeting. Instead, the attackers decided to go after the authoritative DNS servers for the ISPs who were providing transit bandwidth for these financial institutions. We believe that this was a diversionary uh, tactic, that the idea was that the attackers were seeing some successful defenses 
start to be set forth by these ISPs, and so they were trying to essentially distract the attention of the security teams at the ISPs by attacking the ISPs' own authoritative DNS uh, infrastructure. So we saw a lot of uh, relatively high uh, bits per second, connections per second, transactions per second, packets per second, per host, um, multiple targeted organizations within the same industry vertical, the financial sector, were targeted during this attack campaign. It was very, very obvious that the attackers were monitoring the efficacy of the attacks from multiple points across the internet because when the defenders would do something that would um, render some of the attack mechanisms that the attackers were using ineffective, the attackers would change gears. They would use their tools to, do, to generate different types of traffic and then we would see them actually rewriting the attack code as well. So these attackers were very, very focused on keeping their targets down to the degree, to the degree possible during the attack campaign. Um, in, a few, in a few cases, um, the attackers got really frustrated when the defenders were able to successfully defend the targets. And so they actually switched over to using more conventional uh, botnets consisting of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands um, of compromised consumer class PCs and doing some things like spoof sin flooding and stuff like that. That was not the majority uh, of the attack traffic that we saw during the campaign, however. Next slide, please. So, why did the attackers use a server-based botnet? A few reasons for this. Generally, these are more powerful machines with um, relatively high amounts of bandwidth available per machine. Um, they're never shut down. They're on 24 by 7. They're never rebooted or anything like that. Um, there was actually less of a chance in many cases that administrators would notice and try to do something about this because a lot of hosting providers, a lot of co-location providers, a lot of VPS um, providers don't have any kind of instrumentation to monitor their networks, to, to understand when anomalous, potentially malicious traffic is emanating from, from their networks or from their customer servers. And so a lot of them just simply are unaware, and the attackers knew this. And so they went after servers that were in a lot of smaller, more marginal um, IDCs around the world. Um, it was also very easy for the attackers to identify new hosts to compromise because, again, they were exploiting vulnerabilities in these various content management systems like Joomla and WordPress and so forth. What they were able to do was to use search engines. They would go and find a vulnerable version of, say, Joomla, and they would go and spot the vulnerabilities in the, in the code, and they would actually use search engines to search for servers that were running outdated versions of this code so that they could infiltrate them and turn them into bots um, as part of this botnet. Now, the, the industry press and the mainstream press, when they got a hold of the story, were saying, oh, wow, this is something new and different that we've never seen before. It's radically different. That's not the case. We really started to see DDoS attacks emerge on ARPANET and then the, the nascent internet starting in the, in the late 80s. I think IRC was introduced in 1987 or 1988. And um, in order to control IRC, Internet Relay Chat Networks, the idea was is that you have a server somewhere and you would run some code called bot code to control your channel to see who has operator privileges or if you need to ban somebody from a channel uh, for uh, uncouth behavior or things of that nature. And so the first DDoS attacks that we actually tended to see were between these various bots running on you know, various types of Unix servers using CTCP floods or DCC floods in IRC and moving on to ICMP and later um, other slightly more sophisticated methodologies. And so the first bots ran on servers because that's all there was on ARPANET and the early internet. And so this is actually more of a back to the future kind of thing, getting back to the roots of the internet as we know it today. Next slide, please. So, um, Robot, Kamikaze, Amos were the main attack streams um, of code that were used for this particular um, attack campaign. Um, they all had much greater capabilities than the attackers generally utilized. The attackers only utilized very basic functions in all of these various scripts um, that we were seeing. Um, and the attackers continued uh, to tinker with them. There were additional variations of the code. Um, and again, they did step back to more conventional botnets um, a few times. 
when the attackers were successfully mitigating the attack traffic generated by the server-based botnet. Next slide, please. So multiple uh, attack vectors, like we, we, we stated, um, very relatively high traffic uh, per source. That's not something we see in most DDoS attacks. There certainly are exceptions, but most DDoS attacks, we typically see a larger number of sources with a relatively small, smaller uh, amount of bits per second, packets per second, connections per second, transactions per second. Um, the current campaign of NTP attack that's going on right now is another big exception to that, but generally that's what we see. Um, the fact that the attackers were so specific in pre-announcing what their targets are going to be and the time windows they were going to use um, their botnet to attack those targets, that was um, unusual. The attack volumes were overkill. Again, this, these DDoS attacks started out around 55, 60 gigabits per second, went up to 70 gigabits per second, maxing out at about 100 gigabits per second, started at around 30 million packets per second, maxing out around 40 million packets per second. The thing is, almost all DDoS attacks are overkill because most of the targets that they're going after are so fragile and brittle and non-scalable that it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth, it doesn't take a lot of throughput to knock them over. Most DDoS attacks are overkills, but these are, were way overkill. They actually were filling up transit links at some point, and so the attackers very much intended these attacks to be highly visible. They intended a significant amount of collateral damage that would be noticed by ordinary users because they wanted to, to gain a lot of attention and get a lot of eyes focused on these attacks. Why, we really don't know. Next slide, please. So, the attackers performed some reconnaissance. They had identified the URIs uh, for the login subsystems, the large files to download, things of that nature that would cause significant impact on middle tier and back tier systems in the financial institutions that they were targeting. Um, they would um, also, they would use these interesting patterns of URIs that they would do gets and posts against. The URIs themselves didn't actually exist, but they were plausible in the context of the URI schema that was being utilized by the target. And so that made it a lot um, trickier for the target organizations to filter out this traffic because the attackers had taken time to learn their URI schema. And so that was an interesting bit of, of, of reconnaissance there. Um, they were launching attacks against an increasing number of targets concurrently. They knew that ISPs and MSSPs were involved in defending these targets, and so they were trying to stretch the defending organizations thin. Um, uh, when they went after the authoritative DNS servers um, at, the, at the ISPs, that was interesting. We instantly knew that that was a diversionary tactic. They were trying to pull ISP operational security um, personnel away from defending the targeted organizations and force the ISP to spend time and effort in OPEX defending its own authoritative DNS infrastructure. In phase three, they started trying to attack network infrastructure. Some attackers, some very crucial attackers, will lead with that. These attackers were learning as they went, and they started trying to go after um, network infrastructure of the various ISPs and MSSPs that were defending against these attacks. In one very notable case, they succeeded. One of the ISPs that was mitigating these attacks had recently re-IP'd some of their mitigation centers, and they hadn't gone and, and updated their IACLs, or infrastructure ACLs, that keeps outsiders from sending traffic directly to those routers and layer three switches. <clears throat> and so the attackers were able to actually take down those mitigation centers. And all the traffic going to the targets that were being protected by this ISP was flowing through those mitigation centers. And so by taking down the mitigation center, they actually took down the target. It was very interesting because this particular ISP had all the traffic coming from the spot and had towards a target flowing through mitigation center A. All of a sudden, mitigation center A goes down. So now they start diverting the traffic into mitigation center B. Boom, mitigation center B goes down. They divert it all to mitigation center C. Boom, mitigation center C goes down. And it took them a while to figure out that they had not updated their IACLs and the attackers were watching the routing within their network and then were attacking the network infrastructure in the mitigation centers. Once that ISP figured that out after a few hours, they updated their IACLs, the attackers weren't able to do that anymore. But the attackers 
were very watching this because as soon as the attacker moved the traffic via BGP from one mitigation center to the, the other, the attackers were very quick to, to do their trace routes from various locations, identify the mitigation center infrastructure, and then attack it directly. Next slide, please. So, different MO from most DDoS attacks, um, low number of sources, high number of, high amount of traffic per source, pre-announcement, um, predefined attack windows, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, the, the, these DDoS attacks succeeded via the same way that almost every other DDoS attack I've ever seen succeeded. And that's because the defenders were almost completely unprepared. ISPs and MSSPs who actually were in the DDoS mitigation business were unprepared in many cases. They had very rigid procedures that they would use to mitigate traffic. They had a cookie cutter template that they would use for all of their customers, not customizing it based on the types of servers and applications and services that that particular customer was using. Um, in many cases, it was difficult to get them to, to shift it defensive mechanisms quickly in response to changing uh, attack um, conditions. In some cases, ISPs and MSSPs had invested a significant amount of money of CapEx in mitigation systems, but their personnel were not completely familiar with how to effectively utilize those mitigation systems. So they were doing the same thing over and over again, even when it wasn't appropriate. Some ISPs and MSSPs actually had a considerable amount of mitigation capacity that they had not deployed. They had it on their planning to deploy it, but they hadn't built those mitigation centers out yet. And they were also very slow to realize this, and because they were in something of an emergency situation, get this additional capacity deployed. Next slide, please. Um, many of the ISPs and MSSPs that had mitigation capabilities we're not using the latest and greatest capabilities. They didn't have all the tools that were at their disposal deployed and operationalized on their networks. Um, a lot of the, the ISPs and MSSPs, or I would say a lot, many of them that had trouble initially, um, again, even the countermeasures that they used on a daily basis, some of the folks actually configuring the mitigation systems and responsible for mitigating the attacks didn't have a complete understanding of how to utilize even those tools they use on a daily basis as efficaciously um, as possible. Um, some of the ISPs had up-to-date technology. They had all their mitigation capacity deployed. They had a good understanding of their countermeasures, but they weren't able to bring all of their mitigation capacity to bear at one time for any given customer they were protecting because they hadn't implemented any cache diversion so that they could actually, instead of diverting customer A into mitigation center A and customer B in a mitigation center B, or diverting all customers in the mitigation center A or B, utilize A, B, C, and D for one customer. They didn't have any CAS diversion um, enabled on their networks. Next slide, please. Enterprises. The biggest lesson learned by the enterprise is that so-called IPS devices and stateful firewalls don't help when it comes to DDoS attacks. They actually make it a lot easier for the attacker to knock over um, the entire server stack. Um, they didn't have a lot of knowledge of their own traffic patterns, understanding the protocols and ports um, and types of traffic that were used on their front end and their back end systems. They didn't have on-site DDoS mitigation capabilities. They didn't have an arrangement with a DDoS uh, clean pipe service provider as well. Next slide, please. Go ahead and click. So they had their stateful firewalls and their and their web application firewalls, and then click, please, advance one. Okay, so they had their legitimate traffic. Advance again. Advance again, please. Yeah, the attacker attacked the servers. The firewalls went down. Everything, the IDC was unavailable. Next slide, please. The attackers were changing their attack, uh, tactics in real time. The enterprises at first couldn't really keep up with this. We actually saw some back-end or middle-tier corruption of databases as a result of these attacks where the authentication subsystems for some of these financial institutions that were being attacked ha had trouble dealing with the, the amount of connections and transactions, so they fell over. And this apparently caused database corruption in the middle-tier or the back-tier. As a result, a couple of these banks 
were actually unable to offer any online services to their customers for a few days because of this second order unintended collateral damage, an attack against availability that ended up causing an integrity problem, and apparently they didn't have sufficient redundancy um, in their backup um, solutions for their authentication databases, so that was kind of interesting as well. Um, also, these organizations did not have appropriate network access policies deployed. I mean, who allows UDP 53 into a web server, for example? Now, that wouldn't take care of, of the, the filling up of the last mile or last kilometer transit link, but still it would have kept that, those malformed DNS queries off the load balancers if they have them, off the reverse proxies, off the servers themselves. Next slide, please. So a lot, very few of the organizations who were targeted understood their network traffic. Very few of them had even considered DDoS attacks. Very few of them had considered availability at all. If they had a plan for DDoS attacks, most of them um, had not rehearsed it um, at all. It's a huge problem in all industry. I'm not picking on the financial industry here. Um, DDoS attacks should be included in business continuity planning and disaster, um, disaster planning. Um, they're not for some reason. It, DDoS attacks are essentially a man-made disaster that's waiting to happen, but folks don't seem to take that into account when they're doing business continuity planning and risk assessments um, and things of that nature. It's also very interesting that there's no PCI DSS component for availability as well. Next slide, please. So almost all security spending focuses on confidentiality and integrity. Why? Because it's conceptually easy for non-specialists to understand encryption. As we've all seen, encryption isn't necessarily that easy to implement properly. Lots and lots of implementation problems. But at least non-specialists can understand the concept of encryption and decryption. When we're talking about availability, it's multidisciplinary. You have to have people who have a, an understanding of systems from layer one through layer seven. They need to understand the application stack, the server OS, the routing, the switching, um, the ancillary support services like DNS, et cetera. It's hard. Availability is hard. And people tend to focus on easy problems rather than hard ones. Next slide, please. Uh, what I, basically what I just said. Um, most organizations that we survey don't have a plan for dealing with DDoS attacks. Roughly 70 to 75 percent of them don't have any plan at all. Of that 20 to 25 percent who have a plan for dealing with DDoS attacks, a third or less have ever rehearsed their plan for dealing with DDoS attacks. Next slide, please. Are we doomed? No. Because during this attack campaign, the ISPs and the MSSPs and the enterprises that had problems dealing with this stuff slowly got their act together. And so we saw this kind of forced Darwinian evolution, deploying BCPs like having instrumentation, for example, deploying BCPs like a standard network access control mechanism, let's say for, and policy for web servers, for example, or for DNS servers and things like that. Things that folks should have done but they didn't, they started to do. Application folks started talking to database folks who were talking to server admins, who were talking to network admins, who were talking to the operational security people at the upstream transit providers. And they all came together in these virtual teams. They were able to finally to scramble, to, to move in an agile manner, and to successfully deal with these attacks. Um, it's important to understand as we think about IPv6, IPv6 is not a security panacea. IPv6 has essentially all the same problems related to security as IPv4, plus some new ones. They're specific to IPv6, and it's all in hex. Um, so people thinking that, uh, that IPv6 is somehow going to save them from this stuff, they're wrong. They actually have to spend even more time and effort with IPv6 to make sure that they have all their bases covered. Um, automation is a good thing. You want to automate as much as possible, but at the, the end of the day, Security, and I work for a security vendor, security vendor does not consist of things that you buy, hardware you buy, software you buy. 80 to 90 percent of actual security consists of things that you do. And that's why it's hard. Next slide, please. 
So you can see here on the left about 60 gigabits per second. This is during an early phase, 60 gigabits per second um, of attack traffic. On the right, uh, and that's from an ISP doing mitigation um, on its network, an ISP providing um, transit for one of the financial institutions under attack. On the right-hand side, you see about 2 million packets per second of traffic still making it on through to a financial institution. And this particular financial institution actually had some organic um, DDoS mitigation capability on site as well. So their ISP is doing the, hef the heavy lifting of most of the attack volume and then some very specific layer 7 stuff this particular enterprise um, is actually mitigating. Next slide, please. So if you want to download this presentation, uh, there's a URI and there's a short URI for it as well. There's some additional presentations on related topics. Um, the Arbor Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report is available to you um, as well. Also, source-based remote trigger black hole, which is a very valuable tool in dealing uh, with these attacks. There's the RFC for it. Next slide, please. Uh, time for a couple of questions and answers. I went a little bit over, so, um, and if you want to download the presentation, you can also use this QR code. Any questions, comments? Either I've stunned you all into insensibility or put you all to sleep. Not sure which. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Hope it was useful. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Roland. So next up, we've got Cody Williams, who will be talking about submarine networks in Asia. Everybody hear me all right? All right, cool. Uh, my name is Cody Williams. I work for a company called Telegeography. Uh, we do, uh, let's go advance one side, please. So we focus on international networks and doing research on things. Uh, I've basically got two different uh, products I'll be showing you today. It's our uh, internet bandwidth product and also our global bandwidth product. And so when I say internet, what we're referring to is just public IP traffic. How about now? All right. Uh, my internet data that I'm showing you is mid-year 2013. Uh, when I refer to bandwidth, we'll be doing three different sections here, uh, internet, bandwidth, and pricing. And bandwidth, it's a combination of internet traffic, switch voice, and also private network traffic. Switch voice traffic is obviously very small now. It's less than 1%. Uh, go back, please. But uh, feel free to raise your hand as I'm talking if anything is unclear as far as what's on the figures and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know if we'll have time at the end, but I'm around the next couple days. I also have my email at the very end, so feel free to email me or if you would like to actually speak with me in the next couple days, uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to help you out. Yeah, one slide, please. So first thing we'll talk about is Internet in uh, Southeast Asia. One more slide, please. So the continuing story has been decreasing growth. And this year, if we look at worldwide, uh, in mid-year 2013, we observed 33% growth. Now, if we go back a couple of years and we look at 2009, we're looking at 63% growth. Uh, despite this, though, if we look at 2011 and 2013, we almost doubled from 55 terabits to 104 terabits. If we actually take another step further back, uh, 2009, we're looking at 24 terabits worldwide versus the 104 now. Two slides, please. Uh, also, one more slide. Uh, another thing, uh, I've got a lot of my notes actually in the slides. Uh, they won't show up very well on here because the figures are behind them. So I'll talk through them, and uh, you can download the slides off the Apricot site and follow along that way. Uh, also, I know that I speak uh, very fast sometimes because I get very excited about this because I spend most of my time in my little office doing this. So when I get to come and speak to people, uh, sometimes it comes out way too fast. If so, just do like this to me and get me to slow down. I won't be offended or anything. Uh, one important number we talk about here is 41%. So it's this red dashed line across here. Uh, this is the threshold to double every two years with compounding. We're also here looking at peak traffic, which a, uh, I guess for this crowd maybe, it, I don't need to explain that peak traffic is kind of the most important of, of, of uh, 
of average traffic and bandwidth just because peak traffic is going to grow your actual or cause your actual upgrades when your network gets too full. And looking at, at 2013 here, uh, Africa and Latin America were above this 41% threshold. Uh, Asia was right under it at 40%. And looking back a couple years in 2009, we see Asia at 80% and actually see Africa up here at 117%. Now these are just growth rates uh, within themselves, right? So it's not absolute volume. Because we talk about this much growth in Africa, it still is quite small compared to even a single country like the US or the UK or other hubs like that, even here in Singapore. Advance two, please. Also here, we're looking at the concentration of carriers. So there's a lot of carriers, right? A lot of countries, a lot of different players. Uh, we see this uh, pretty much all over the world. Uh, Asia is actually less concentrated than many other regions. If, we, if you look here, we see that the, the yellow, which is the others category, so from number 21 below as far as actual size, have been taking a little more pie if, uh, on the absolute terms. And that's not really surprising because we've seen a lot of, of Asia's growth has been here in Southeast Asia and other places where even the incumbents aren't as big as the big international players. But over time, we see the top five has gone from 34 to 31%, so it's been relatively stable. And the, uh, the others category has gone from 27% in 2009 to 36%, so there is growth there. Advance two, please. And if we actually look in Southeast Asia itself, growth rates here, we see quite a bit of growth here, uh, all four of these countries, but especially in Vietnam this one year. And now I should say this is bandwidth. This is actually not... Uh, one, one correction here, on the far left side, it is actually not share of potential that is lit. This is just internet bandwidth. So annualized growth, internet bandwidth. So we see a lot of growth the one year here in Vietnam. That doesn't necessarily mean there's that much growth in used, uh, used or peak traffic. We see a big growth in bandwidth. and We pull it out, we actually see a more neutral growth in both of those categories. But upgrades are inherently lumpy, just because you put on a bunch at once, and it kind of goes without saying. Uh, but we also have to look at two different categories when we talk about growth. If you'll see here, we've got three fairly small countries in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is very unique in that it grows very quickly and is very big. Uh, advance two, please. And here's the actual capacity of all of these. And you see Singapore far outweighs all of them. Uh, it's not really surprising. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam aren't really hubs. The traffic is just going to the country. Where Singapore has a lot of traffic, but it obviously is going other places, right? Because everything is hubbed through there. Uh, you go in there to pick up content from uh, caches and things like that also. But of these uh, of these four here, Vietnam was the fastest growing with a five-year CAGR of 56.5%. Now we like to look at uh, these five-year CAGR, so five years of growth annualized just because it helps smooth out the, the inherent lumpiness of the upgrades. Advance two, please. Now comparing Singapore to some other hubs, so we, we want to back it out a little bit. And these are compared to themselves, so this is a, at the share of the 100%. And we see the top three here, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo, are all of our major Asian hubs right now, compared to New York and London. And you see that Asia has grown in proportion to New York and London. Not really surprising. We've seen that that uh, all three of these have grown: Hong Kong, New York, excuse me, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo, at 34.5% or greater. While New York and London uh, have grown much less. London's been around 29% annualized, and New York has been about 22%. Events one, please. I'll talk a little bit about submarine cable systems. Events one. And this is just costs over the past four years. Now, all this data here, uh, we're in the process of updating it, so this will actually get pushed out another year. Uh, that data will be complete in the next month or so, so if you'd like updated versions of this, uh, send me an email. But as far as Asia goes, you see there's a little bit under half a billion dollars in 20, 2011 to 2012, and about a billion dollars in 2013, 2014. And this is primarily in three systems. So if you look at it, ASC was about 430 million estimated costs, uh, SJC was around 400, and APG, APG is about 500 million. Events two, please. Now looking at how everything has been supplied by route, 
uh, as we move into 40 and 100G technologies, we've seen uh, upgrades taken in a lion's share of the new capacity. And in Asia, it's no different. Uh, Transpac, we see here that there's 32% from new, new cables, which is all Unity. Uh, everything else has been through upgrades. Inter-Asia is only 22% has been through new cables. If you look somewhere like Transatlantic, it's been entirely upgrades. Uh, the cost base there and the fact that a lot of those systems are brought out of bankruptcy makes uh, the build proposition much harder than in other places. Advance two, please. Looking at bandwidth and supply, uh, this is year in 2012. Uh, we had about 14.4 terabits of lit capacity in Asia. Uh, of that, a little under 10 was purchased and unused, and about five and a half was purchased and used. Uh, now, if we had a, a, a fuller version of this, we'd actually also have potential capacity, which as many of you know is, is very much a theoretical number based on what technology is around at the time. Uh, we're very well into the 100G potential capacities now, and looking at it, for tw in 2012, that 14.4, was about 13% of our estimated potential for a year in 2012. Uh, we should be getting in our new update a lot more 100G uh, potentials, so we'll see if that affects it at all. But it's been a pretty steady march, uh, about 13% for Asia for several years, even though we've changed technologies. Uh, over these past five years, it's only varied between 13% and 17%, even though we've had a big technological jump. Events two, please. We we'll look at inter-Asia capacity by cable. Uh, three cables make up the bulk of the capacity. And this is obviously, again, is relative to each other. But of these three, uh, North Asia loop is about 3.8 terabits at year in 2012. Uh, APCM is also about 3.8, and EACC to C was 3.2. Uh, some of these have, always, have been updated, uh, or upgraded, I should say. Uh, I know EACC to C has been for sure. But when we talk about this too, there's other things like CMEWE 3 is very small in relation here, but it does serve important purposes in that it connects unique places like Myanmar, and it also has a unique routes like the west coast of Australia. So even though the bulk is with these three cables, there are reasons for the other cables to still be in service, even though some of them are getting older and things like that. Events 2, please. So we'll look at the actual how everything looked in Asia. So this is how it was in 2004. Can you advance one, please? This is what we had. Uh, go back one. So we had 13, 313 gigabits of usage in 2004 uh, in Asia, 2.3 terabits worldwide, and 23 cable systems in Asia. Uh, advance one, please. When we talk about the big thing that happened a couple years ago, it's been a handful of years now, was the earthquake off of Taiwan and kind of how that affected cable systems. Because when this happened, uh, almost all cable systems were out for at least a small period of time. Uh, only EAC and the Guam Philippines cable weren't affected. I won't get too much into this because there's actually a really good paper on AP NIC site from a couple years back for someone analyzing this. But since this happened, uh, TPE and AAG have built, been built uh, avoiding the Luzon Strait here while these cables pass through. That's one, please. One more, please. This is 2008, what it looks like. Uh, one more, please. 2.3 terabits of usage in Asia, 18.8 uh, terabits worldwide, and 38 cable systems uh, connecting Asia. One more. And here, here we are today. So we've got 13.28 terabits uh, in Asia, uh, 93.9 terabits worldwide, and 46 cables connecting Asia. Uh, quite a long way from 2004. We've got almost twice as many cable systems, actually exactly twice as many cable systems at 23 versus 46. Uh, advance one, please. Now I want to talk a little bit about pricing. Uh, one more, please. Prices have been going down quite a bit in the past handful of years. It's a, uh, depending on if you're a buyer or seller, it's either been really great or really, really bad. Uh, the problem we've also seen is as prices have gone down, and as uh, capacity has been growing at a slower rate, we've actually had people starting to go negative, right? So before, you hope that capacity increases outstrip price declines, and you, even though you did more, you still made the same amount of money. Uh, some rounds we see people that are doing more and making less than they were last year or the year before. Now looking at gig EIP uh, between 2012 and 2013, all, all Q2, starting at Q2 and ending at Q2, uh, we see uh, Taipei at 35, and 
when she'd go down the range to a uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, about 22, 21 for those guys. And if we move to 2013, we see Taipei is now at 17, about half of what it was. And Hong Kong and Singapore are about seven. Uh, these are all median prices also. So the low end price, depending on who you are as a buyer, is actually much lower than this. Uh, we're still seeing the median price is about seven, even in uh, a couple quarters later. We're finalizing that data also. But uh, the low end prices are now $5 and below for some carriers. One more, please. One more. Looking at wavelength prices here. So we've got three waves here, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Singapore, Tokyo, the three major routes. Uh, same trend here, right? We're seeing them fall quite a bit from 2012 to 2013. Uh, ending around a little bit north of $15,000 after starting out between about 65 and 85. We've seen these dramatic price wars uh, reoccurring, but we're not sure. Frankly, we thought they would level off much sooner than now, but they seem to keep going. Uh, I don't know what the floor is. A question I get asked a lot is, what about this versus transatlantic prices? I should point out that it's a very different market in the two of them for several reasons. Uh, one, all the transatlantic uh, cables were almost all bought out of bankruptcy, so there's a very different cost basis for the Transpac cables. Uh, virtually all of the transatlantic cables are owned by single owners versus a lot of consortiums and other things on the Asian cables. And the only cable that I know of in, in Asia that was bought out of bankruptcy is Pacific Crossing when NTT bought it, bought it out of bankruptcy. Uh, everyone else has had to continue to pay for their own cable, uh, not had that reduced cost basis, which can really affect uh, how much you can charge and get away with. But uh, we thought the floor for transatlantic would be, or at least uh, when I talked to people, I thought the floor had already happened, and it seems that that's not the case. We keep inching down lower and lower. So who knows where we'll end up here in, in, in Asia. Uh, go ahead and go to you. So that's all I've got a, uh, for today. No, we, no, excuse me, I've got one more here. So we're going to compare uh, Hong Kong to a couple other places because I think it's helpful to get a, a relative idea of what's going on. So we talked about Hong Kong went from 21 to 7. If you look at Sao Paulo, it halved also from 40 to 20. And then New York and London have been uh, historically the lowest routes, uh, starting out at 5 and 4 apiece, and now uh, New York is about 2 and London sub two for medium price. You can get it for less than a dollar depending on who you are as a buyer and how much volume and kind of customer you are. I'll go ahead and go to you. That's all I have today. Uh, sorry, it was actually much quicker than anticipated, but hopefully that's okay. Uh, do, you want, do, you, do you want me to do any questions since I have time? So if you have questions so I can answer them, go ahead. Something magic. There you go. Step used to my clinic. Um, I have two questions. The first one, in talking and looking at the Luzon Strait and your various maps over time, it appears that the majority of cables still go to the west of the Philippines and through the Luzon Strait yes. and go to the east of Taiwan. Yes. They're all in the same channel, right? They are, as far as I know. The same earthquake fault zone. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. Yeah. So, in, in essence, the vulnerability that we see in that area of Asia, which is basically Singapore and everything connected around there, is as present today as it was back in whatever year it was when, when that well, submarine landslide happened. Well, keep in mind too that you've got a lot more options going west through Europe now than you did four or five years ago. There's been a lot of new builds that way. So we're actually seeing a lot more traffic from Singapore going that way, if it's, if it's heading towards Europe, right? Because Going, if you, if you have Singapore traffic to Europe and you went the old way of going all the way around the world, a lot of latency other things involved. But the prices on that end have gone down quite a bit. So, and I, I think that a lot of carriers themselves have also taken better measure of what they can do as far as a, uh, maybe not only having Luzon cables and you know being willing to buy, uh, pay the premium for the cables that don't run through there, even if it's just for restorative purposes. So to an extent it's better, but I don't, it's not like it's not gone. And the other thing too is if you're going to the west, you also have problems going through Egypt too. The similar similar constraint going through the Suez Canal. So, so my second question is actually in the pricing and uh -huh. the structure here of these cable systems because on one of those slides you kind of intimated that there is a 
supply side overhang 10 times greater than the amount of deployed lit used capacity. So yeah. 13 terabits, but there's potential to light it to 113 or something uh -huh. amazingly big. In most markets, when you get under competitive pressure, someone blinks, they dump capacity on the market, the price just slumps overnight, and everyone goes in a mad race to the bottom because exactly. as soon as one person blinks, the entire cartel just falls apart. Ah. And I believe a lot of the bankruptcies in the Atlantic market had that sort of problem in the ah. early 2000s. Yes. You mentioned in your talk that you thought the joint ownership cartels that underlie a lot of these cable systems was the factor that was keeping the prices I would say artificially high. Would you like to comment on that a bit further? Because it's one of these sort of interesting cases where any other market with an overhang of 10 times the current demand, you're going to see a price dump any second. Yet somehow it hasn't happened here yet. Yeah, so I should, I should point out the potential capacity is very much a theoretical number. And the, why I say that is because it's if you go to Cisco Infineer and you have a cable system and say, what can you do if we buy the best of the best of the best right now. And the problem is, is that option is usually really expensive, so no one ever goes for it. You'll see the potential here, and it's actually higher in the Atlantic, too. It's single digits of lit versus potential, so it's even greater there. But I don't necessarily think that a, uh, the consortiums that own the cables are keeping prices high. Uh, we've actually seen, you always hear complaints that one or two guys on a consortium will start dumping prices because they need cash right now, or they're doing different ways of selling things. They're selling five-year leases, but they're they're recurring a loss now, and they're going to get it back in the future and things like that. I think the big thing is just an absolute cost basis because all these cable systems are very expensive to build. And when you came in, you could buy an entire system for pennies on the dollar in the Atlantic. It brings your entire basis down. Now, there's uh, there's it's not uh, very simple as simple as that because there's a lot of other things going on, right? So we're seeing like backhaul RUs in Atlantic. Some of them are starting to come up now, which might affect the cost. Uh, we're also seeing the fact that those cables are starting to get old, and uh, maybe someone's going to build one relatively soon in the next 10 years, 5 years. Uh, there's no plans right now. We're, we are starting to see plans for more transpac cables. But uh, so apparently the floor is not so low that the, there isn't that cost barrier there. But yeah, they're both very different markets, and it's, it's a common question I get, but I think they're very hard to compare just because one of them you're paying $400 million for a cable, and one of them you bought for nothing, essentially, or less, or close to nothing, I should say. No one else is coming, so I have one more question. Well, keep going, let's go. The business case for Hibernia Cable in the Atlantic mm -hmm. was based on a six millisecond differential yep. on the basis, you know, from mm -hmm. New York to New York. Six milliseconds. If you need and, that six milliseconds, though, it's worth it. And, and it, one, it yeah. basically, that was the funding for mm -hmm. Hibernia. Have you seen that degree of delay intolerance in the trans-Pacific market in particular? Are they that sensitive? There's premiums for faster cables in the Atlantic, or excuse me, in the Pacific for sure. Uh, I don't think it's, I haven't seen the same frenzy, I would, I would say, as getting it from New York to London. Because apparently, you know, there's a lot of fractional trading people want to do between those two. And it seems like there's less between New York or however you want to say, from the Seattle or, or whoever on the West Coast to Tokyo. Uh, there's been a premium for latency, I think, all over the world. It's not that great, I don't believe. Uh, it also seems like there's always something people are chasing. Yeah. And for a while, latency was that thing. And people are still very sensitive to it. But it seems like I hear less about people going in pure latency plays now. And we'll see if Hibernia Atlantic is built. It might. If you can get the, those handful of guys that are doing financial trading that need that six or five or four millisecond advantage, if you can get them to pay for it, then build it. That's your business case. Yeah, Thank exactly. you very much. No problem. Hey. Hi. I've got a question from Simon coming in from the Jabber. He says, what is the status of Southeast Asia regarding internet growth? India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Myanmar. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, I can. I don't know the numbers offhand, but I, uh, so I can't. They've been growing quite rapidly. Those are the fastest growing countries. But I can't give you actual numbers right now as I stand up here. Uh, please send me an email. I can help you out with that. Okay, thanks.
Hi, Cody. This is Gaurav. Actually, it relates to what uh, Simon just asked. Uh, where do you see a gap in submarine systems uh, in APAC, including South Asia? Because uh, you talked about more traffic going westwards, but my experience is that there is a big lack of capacity going from Singapore to Mumbai, or at least that stretch is, yes. you know, and pricing there is not coming down. So hard to believe that you are seeing more traffic going westward. So if you can add a bit more on that. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of the Europe-Asia cables uh, don't come in nearly as far as they would, they should. Uh, we're seeing uh, the Bay of Bengal has been a, uh, several projects have been discussed through there. Uh, I should say we've seen much more bandwidth growth on that end. It says as new cables have come on, so looking at uh, some of the Middle Eastern cables, basically. But yeah, there's still room for growth there, I, I just want to say. It's, it's actually really hard for me to hear you, so if you want to talk more about this question after through, we'll do that. <laughs> so any more questions for Cody? Guess not. So thank you for the question. Thanks very much, Cody, for your presentation. And so next up we have Hideo Ishii who will be talking about the challenges of building a hundred gig backbone across Asia. On, right? Okay, good. Okay, uh, uh, hello everybody, and uh, I'm from uh, uh, Parknet. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Hideo Ishik, and I'm going to start the uh, presentation for the uh, 100G IP backbone. But, uh, but actually, I'm talking about the uh, more subsea side, and because you know, pretty much, uh, you, know, you know, IP backbone rely on the you know, you know international capacity or the subsea system, so. I think coming. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, yeah, let's start. I'm uh, in a Parknet. Probably uh, not many people are aware of the Parknet as a company. And uh, Parknet is the uh, telecommunication company. Uh, you, you know, focusing on the Asia. Uh, we have a subsea system in Asia, uh, as Cody said, that uh, one EAC C2C and Trans Pacific is uh, EAC Pacific, you know, in actually in over unity. Uh, we have a two fiber pair over unity. And uh, we have a data center around Asia as well, and they'll be providing the uh, internet access service and ILU, IPL, and so on and so forth. And uh, we have IP backbone in Asia, and basically uh, uh, between the major city in the, from Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, Philippines, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and the US over uh, ESC Pacific. And uh, we, uh, I'm looking after now uh, not only IP as well as the uh, uh, you know, service system. So today, uh, presentation focusing on the uh, more uh, you know sub C side rather than IP side because I did uh, many times for the uh, in IP backbone stuff. So during the uh, in IP call, uh, those other you know, you know conference. Uh, next, maybe three, four, five pages. Next, yeah, this is our C cable system. We have a two two cable system. Uh, it's it's a very you know yeah. It yeah, looks like very complicated, but uh, we interconnect together to 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 utilize the uh, each ca you know those each capacity for the backup as well as the uh, uh, some redundancy purpose. Okay, next. Oh, this is IP. Yeah, next. And uh, for IP side, it's a very simple and straightforward. We have a uh, you know cable station core router, hop core router, and uh, some aggregation router, and also we enable. Uh, in MPSTP, and uh, also, uh, yeah, backbone is basically 10G at this moment, uh, using uh, some, uh, you know, link aggregation, as well as the, uh, you know, some of the other, you know, uh, in technology, and uh, IP backbone in Asia is uh, basically unprotected, and the router itself will do the, uh, some self, you know, uh, backup and, uh, you know, protection work, and IPv4, IPv6 are available now, and the uh, protocol is the IASIS and BGP. Next, please. 
Uh, next, please. The next. Okay. Uh, basically, I think everybody know that, right? Because the you know IP router is connected to the uh, DWDM that you know those equipment and set up the IP backbone. But actually, topology wise, IP backbone topology and the layer one capacity topology is completely different, right? And actually, say that let's say Singapore to Japan is a you know I have a Singapore Japan capacity, but physically hop by hop, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan, right? But some of IP guys doesn't care because this is a pretty much layer one uh, topology and operation. But as layer one perspective, you know, in the same, you know, we don't care, right? Because just to give you the capacity from A to B, and that you can enjoy the capacity, and the some of the, the gap in between, in, then uh, so that, uh, but we try to find out a way to synchronize each other to get the uh, more efficiency as well as the more capacity and the more easy to get the more capacity anyway. Next week. Okay, uh, this diagram is a, is a very simple one, right? Because everybody is doing a similar type of connectivity from the uh, country, right? Uh, sorry, uh, you know, between the countries. So basically, uh, IP service provider has a router in city to connect to the DW equipment or, or or buy capacity from uh, international telecommunication provider to set up the international backbone for the IP, right? And uh, physically, rather connect to the DWDM, DWDM connects to the other DWDM at the cable running station. Cable running station has you know, SLTE, and SLTE connects to the other country SLTE, right? And then uh, provision the capacity for the IP. This is 100% this is rely on the uh, L1 capacity design. And also, once we buy or we provision the capacity, uh, just to, just to rely on the layer one capacity design. For instance, uh, I have a capacity from Hong Singapore to Japan. It simply goes through the uh, Hong Kong, uh, sorry, uh, goes through Singapore to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Japan, then go back to the city, right? And then if I have some of the capacity from Singapore to US, also same path or the other path, the, uh, you know, as the common base to set up the pipe. This is, you know, I think IP providers uh, have some design policy for the IP backbone. For instance, uh, uh, you know, like a hub and a spoke or a crew mesh and so on. But actually layer one side is just a simple hop by hop design, right? Uh, so the next piece. Then, uh, Parknet, at that time, uh, in Asian Netcom has, uh, you know, EAC capacity as our own cable system, and the cable station also our own cable station. It's very easy, just, you know, you know ideally easy to deploy the layer three router into cable station. Uh, you know, layerness is that layer one team, layer three team is completely different team. We request them to install a router, but, oh, hey, you know, Actually, nobody knows the radar in cable station. Just we know the transport equipment and SLT, that's all, right? We try to, you know, get there in order to make more efficient IP backbone design. Why? Because normally, if we rely on the layer one capacity design, we cannot, you know, for instance, we have some, you know, pinpoint traffic from cable station to city port, right? Because this is completely layer one capacity and layer one design. So, but when we install the uh, radar in cable station, we can, we could eliminate some of pinpoint traffic from cable station to city port, as well as we can see the more traffic utilization and also radar itself perform the fast reroutes not rely on the, uh, some SDH technology. We can do that. And then we have been doing this design and, not, and then uh, we are happy to get more traffic, more capacity and so on. And in terms of CapEx side, it's 10 G port is same, same vendor, same line card. We can swap the 10 G card to the uh, next router, whatever, and the less and less uh, some maintenance cost as well. Uh, 
sorry, next please. Next please. Yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, this is design for the, uh, yeah, in uh, in instead of the, uh, uh, in SDH link protection, router itself to do the, some fast routes in between the uh, router, right? Uh, sorry, next please. And uh, set up the uh, backup LSP for the IP in order to uh, protect the capacity when the cable cut happened. Uh, next please. So uh, now we have, uh, we have a cable station router uh, at each cable station in Asia. And we have a city uh, router at the city pop to connect each other to uh, you know, set up the existing design. However, it's coming, we will install the uh, more high performance in SLP as well as the router at the cable station to aggregate more 10G traffic. So probably we will have, uh, you know, it, I think 100 gigi uh, connection rather than you know, 40 gigi is connect together. And then uh, cable station aggregation router or switch, I don't know, and connect to the uh, SLT 100G interface, right? I think Asia uh, could say that, uh, you know, actually traffic growth rate is not high at this moment, right? And I don't think we, we need 10, you know, 10 times 100G between Singapore, Hong Kong, Singapore to Japan. Then how do we make the uh, more efficient network design using 100G? It's also a challenge. But I think, uh, you know, uh, PTN core side is like a, you know, optical layer uh, transport equipment improved much, like a layer three equipment, they can handle the packet, they can handle the uh, uh, VLAN uh, in ID base path and so on. We can enjoy not only layer three side and also layer one equipment to uh, corroborate the uh, more you know, efficient uh, sub C IP back over sub C. Okay, next please. Yeah, this is the, uh, I think uh, uh, sub C side is, uh, we are talking about OTN, no, no longer SDH. So because OTN is, can support 100G, but SDH cannot support, cannot, 100, uh, cannot handle 100G, up to 40G only. And uh, yeah, this is the, uh, in OTN and SDH, you know, uh, you know, specification. Again, interest one is, is you know, SDH cannot support 100G handover, but OTN can, right? And uh, also, uh, you know, synchronization. I think everybody know that some of synchronization required in order to set up the, uh, uh, some frame in between, but OTN, they don't need synchronization. Just a free learning, just to connect each other and learning. This is very interesting. Okay, next please. Uh, this is the header. So, so normally many, many uh, layer one transport equipment are supporting the uh, GMPRS over subsea network uh, in recently, right? It's five, 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 eight years before GMPRS is, uh, you know, out of one control frame. It, as far as I know, but the recent one is inbound control frame over, uh, you know, OTU or you know, ODU frame. Uh, I, I think uh, some of, you know, some vendor using, uh, you know, GCC zero, because this is the, uh, you know, you know, ODU, something like that. And the, some vendor using some other uh, field to exchange uh, in OSPF, you know, data in, in between the uh, layer one equipment. Uh, and also interesting one, the TCM field, they have a TCM field in order to exchange the uh, some control data in between. And also, uh, uh, you know, OF, uh, sorry, OIF also describes some of the TCM, uh, you know, utilization and specification for the uh, uh, optical, uh, you know, rare you know, communication anyway. Uh, next, please. Uh, it's not interesting. But uh, this uh, diagram you know, explained that uh, ODU4 is 100G, can uh, uh, you know, encapsulate 
uh, those are OTU3, OTU2, OTU1, those uh, in row theory, you know, frames. Okay, next please. Yeah, saying that, okay, uh, in right side backbone is 100G OTU4, but the other side is OTU3, 40, 40G backbone, right? But, uh, you know, OTU4 can support, uh, you know, handle those uh, OTU3 frame using ODU, in OTU4 frame. So this is uh, some, uh, uh, you know, you know, like, a, you know, multiplexing, like, a, you know, in, like IP, you know, packet-based uh, you know, traffic. Uh, next, please. Uh, then recently, uh, in OTN is a very, uh, for me, it's a very new stuff, and also uh, came the uh, new technology, so-called OTN switching. Traditional uh, transport equipment is just a back-to-back -back connection, line side and client side each other, right? Or, you know, backsponder or transponder handle the uh, client interface to the line side, right? But recent one is a change a little bit and uh, some of switching function in between line side and client side to exchange traffic each other. This is a very unique technology in order to, uh, you know, so that carrier doing some of the uh, new in, in alignment of line and the client interfaces. Let's say some of switching uh, within the, the, those, uh, you know, optical you know, equipment and also some, uh, you know, uh, reroutes. It's also within the, uh, uh, in OTN equipment. So then uh, we can consolidate SDH function, you know, protection and, uh, you know, like a working protection rerouting within the single switch using OTN uh, switching equipment uh, in recent week. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, next one is sub C. Why sub, uh, you know, why 100G? It's a very simple, right? Uh, we are talking about the, some, you know, sometimes they have, you know, carrier spacing. Uh, let's say, uh, traditional one is a 10G using a 50 gigahertz and the 10G a 33 gigahertz, right? And, but if 100G only need 100 gigahertz, it's a very good spectrum efficiency, right? This, you know, this, uh, you know, yeah, this uh, page saying that it's just, uh, if 100, 100 gigabps need 100 gigahertz, just one. Right, some efficiency. If we if we can get 50 gigahertz, 100 G uh, gigabps, this is a two. We can improve more and more uh, spectrum efficiency you, if technology is coming. At this moment, almost the vendor saying that 100 gigahertz and 100 GB. But we will see more. I don't know, but maybe more good uh, technology is coming. Uh, Actually, not only uh, transport technology, it's also the uh, sub uh, cable, let's say, quad uh, core, also, you know, like a deep rust cable system is coming recently, but nobody using it at this moment, uh, you know, within AG, I believe. Probably we can get the uh, more good, you know, spectrum, you know, spectrum efficiency if we have new cable, new design cable, you know, rather than existing uh, like a you know OK based you know cable system uh, next please and uh, I think uh, in order to get the 100g uh, some of the new technology is came recently why is the modulation right if it, uh, yeah, you know like a traditional cable system using not now it used to be using OK uh, in on off key right this is just a uh, just the one symbol can handle one, one bit for a long time. Either long distance or short distance, not a big deal. But recently, we are talking about the VPSK or the QPSK or, you know, like a 60, uh, you know, 60 PSK, something like that. We can propagate more bit within one spectrum. For instance, uh, you know, short distance, long distance is completely different game. 
but Trans-Pacific is around 2,000 kilometer, 10,000 kilometer. As a technology perspective, a BPSK is only available to, to as, uh, you know, as modulation at this moment, right? BPSK need, uh, let's say, you know, 100 gigahertz can handle two bits per symbol, right? But short distance, let's say, uh, 1,000, uh, 1,500 kilometer, we can utilize QPSK, more, more short space, as well as the uh, more bit than carry over the uh, subsystem. system. Let's say this case, uh, you know, 100 G or 50 or 80 G. It's completely different game. Say that, okay, we can propagate uh, 10 terabit over this cable system, saying that QPSK. But long distance is a completely different game total, uh, you know, available capacity is less because, you know, modulation scheme is completely different. Uh, next, please. Okay. This is submarine cable. It's some of, you know, measurement. It's, a, you know, graph from the uh, uh, sub-optics and, in, you know, in Paris. This is a, this is a funny figure. Uh, not funny figure. What is that? Yeah. This is the, uh, you know, showing that BPSK and the QPSK in the uh, sum of transmit distance. This is actual uh, data from the, uh, I think, uh, let me see, whatever. Uh, you know, fiber optics is a key is distance and also characteristics, right? In order to deploy the 100G, it's a vendor and a carrier do some tests to measure the characteristics of cable, you know, those cable system. Dispersion or a Q value and OSNR. And those values are very important to handle the 100G. If less than our expected Q value, we cannot do that. For a long time, vendor couldn't deliver 100G because cannot match the Q value and the their expected Q value. It's completely huge gap. That's why for a long time, some of trial is fine because select the best, less dispersion uh, wave just one channel, you can do it, but if you want to utilize whole channel C-band, very big challenge. But recently, last year, many vendors delivered the, uh, you know, 100, 100G available. system, then also fit the, uh, like, a 10,000 kilometer cable system at this moment. We also deploy the uh, 100G over Transpacific at this moment. Next, please. Then next, uh, very important one is FEC. FEC is a very famous for the IP side as well, but sub -C as well. We have a, a sub-generation, you know, like a so-called SD FEC. SD FEC is a fantastic for us to to gain the more Q value, right? This is most in, one of the most important part of technology in order to provide a 100G over Trans-Pacific. OSNR value, you know, normally, you know, uncoded, this case is a very, you know, needs the uh, huge value of you know, OSNR, but SD effect give us low, you know, low Q, Q value and also in OSNR value, right? Long haul is a high dispersion or a loss, right? So there's a, you know, relatively better than long. And then we will need this software decision fact in order to achieve the 100G deliver around the 10,000 kilometer, you know, cable system. Okay, uh, next please. This is the uh, very, popular discussion with the uh, subsea vendor as well as the uh, you know, subsea cable system vendor. For, I think in Asia, if, if, uh, you know, if I'm mistaken, almost cable system in Asia and Trans-Pacific trans using a, uh, you know, the upper cable uh, fiber, you know, traditional optical fiber system, right? This is the uh, uh, non-zero dispersion. For a long time, 
dispersion should be the zero is better because technology it cannot allow to 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 high you know you know like a very high dispersion ratio and then dispersion also increase based on the distance if a cable length is too long it's like a this is the dispersion is a you know high and low completely different way to to get the uh, you know this characteristic of the uh, cable system for a long time but new one i don't know the cmv5 cmv5 using this cable system but i think everybody thinking about this uh, uncompensated fiber because coherence needs this new RBC cable system characteristics in order to get the 100G capacity. And also allow the, uh, some large core fiber to push more data inside of core. I don't know, but uh, for instance, you know, Agatha Lucent announced the, uh, I don't know, some of the uh, 40 tera capacity of a sub cable system 9,000 kilometer using this large core and also uncompensated E plus cable system to get the, uh, those high capacity. Uh, next, please. Okay. Then those uh, new cable systems coming. Also, we installed a new new transport equipment for the IP side. But some of a gap, right? Actually, both IP and the layer one cap uh, capex per gigabps is going down very fast. But layer one is almost, I think, not too expensive actually, but layer three equipment, 100 gig and 40 gig is still expensive per port, per, per line card actually. This is challenging for the IP side. How can we, how can I get the CapEx approval from, you know, from management, right? Why we need 100 G? Why we cannot use the uh, link aggregation using a 10, you know, 10 gig? This is a big argument internally. How can we, you know, spend the, uh, you know, 100 gig line card cost to, you know, improve as well as the, uh, some good efficiency over sub C and, I, you know, like IP backbone both. And uh, gig is, uh, 10 gig interface is a very commoditized, plus in going down quickly. Let's say switch can support 10 G. It's very, very good cost, of, you know, very cost effective solution using 10 gig, right? But again, still, yeah, you know, line card expensive. Let's say we can ask a Cisco and a Juniper or the other vendor and, uh, or, you know, those are, you know, Cattel to ask the 100 gig uh, handoff of, of layer three, that's still high cost. And the issue is, uh, and uh, yeah, in last week, Issue layer three, layer one, big gap in between because completely different team. Layer, layer three side is, has some layer three engineering team and also layer one guy has some engineering team. It's completely different team, no communication, just a customer on a user type of uh, communication path. This is also a big issue because cannot sync each other to make the uh, network of from sub C to layer three or layer you know, for layer seven, for instance, how can we make the uh, most cost-effective one as technology side as well as the uh, capex opex side? This is also a challenge for layer three side, I, you know, I believe. Uh, next, please. Ah, oh, yeah, thanks. This is so, yeah, so quick. That's all, any question, comment? So no questions for Hideyoshi? Nobody else building 100 gig backbone? If not, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the first APOP session. Um, we have another APOP session tomorrow morning. Um, 
with um, three more presentations in that. Um, you'll find more information on the website. And of course, we have um, other parallel sessions starting with Apricot, as well as tutorials starting for Apricot tomorrow as well. Um, now, just remember, we have the call for lightning talks open. Be open for a bit longer. Um, probably by Wednesday, we should have a pretty good idea what the lightning talks are. The first eight or nine good ones are the ones that the PC will accept, and we'll close the call once we've got eight or nine good ones to talk about. So if you're interested, um, even if you don't have slides, but if you've got a decent idea, please submit it on the submission system, and we'll, we can take a look. Otherwise, we have the opening social event tonight, the opening reception, which is in the atrium of the Pyramid Hotel. So we need to go over about which direction. I think it's probably about that direction. Um, that begins at 7 o'clock tonight. Um, so we'll see you all there. If you don't want to go to that, then we'll see you tomorrow morning 